Hello. Good evening. How are you? All right. That's, that's Sister uh, Thompson. Yes. I oh, just well. got your uh, comments. <laughs> I tell you, it's I, the more I try to get ahead, the farther behind I get. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> oh. How's your week going? It's going okay. Okay. Uh, I just lost you on the screen. Uh oh. I still see myself, so. <laughs> I I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't see I don't see you at all. It's just yeah. a black, black. It's like I I can still hear you, but I've gone for, gone from my screen. And right. I don't know what to do. Must be something with your camera, would be my guess. Okay. Let's see. Like, I, don't know, I don't know how I would get logged out, but it's like I'm logged out. I can still hear you. Yeah, you got time. You might want to. Okay, there you are. Yeah, close up. Oh, I'm, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> um, I tell you, these computers just confound me. I came through the era when we were just beginning to get L A one companion is on. Is that you? That's me. Yes. Okay. Well, we were just learning how to type on the electric typewriter. <laughs> I remember taking that class myself. Oh, we have we have moved well beyond that. <laughs> yes, I thought I would never master the elect the feel of the electric typewriter and not making errors. But this is just you remember the typewriter that had the ball. Yeah, I love that little electric. It was it, it didn't it didn't the carriage didn't go anywhere. Right, I think that <laughs> I think IBM started that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we've seen quite a few changes. It, it just yep. goes to show, you know, just take that same amount of time and consider it in the future. And the advances that we've seen is what, you know, the next generation is going to well, see. Absolutely. It. I mean, I look at I these, imagine it. <laughs> I look at these kids today and they are just whizzes besides me in terms of why don't you get it? You know, all you got to do is this, this, and this. <laughs> right. <laughs> you <just> have it. <laughs> you take a baby born today and you put a remote control in their hand, they know exactly what to do what with to do. it. What to do? Uh, I had this little kid that he was, as long as he had his computer, his grandmother's computer, he was okay. But And she had to have two in case the battery went down on one. So she could give him the other. Right. Wow. To keep him pacified. Hey, Barry. How are we doing, Brother Moore? Pretty good. My grandmother, my dad's mother, was born in 1880. 1880. Oh, my God. And I, I remember, um, no, I'm sorry, 1884, but, you know, hey, who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember sitting with her. You know, we would be watching a TV show or something. And she would sit there and she'd stare at the screen for a minute. And then she'd finally say, how did they get those people in that little box? <laughs> <laughs> I said, and I was sitting there wow. thinking, I'm, I'm like 10 or 11 years old. I'm trying to, I'm, well, let me see if I can explain this. <laughs> Without getting hit. Right, right. No, she wouldn't hit me. It was just that, you know, you're talking about somebody who was born in the 19th century. So yeah. they saw they saw all the modern age come into. Yes. You know, uh, yeah. there were no there were no automobiles. That's right. So she saw she saw the automobile. She saw radio. Radio, correct. And then mm -hmm. television. She lived long enough to see, you know, men achieve the moon landings. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, okay. That had to be really gigantic for her. She was, uh, you know, you know, it's amazing. I mean, when you think about it, right? All the all the mar all the marvels of the twentieth century. My grandmother saw and witnessed all that stuff. <laughs> she saw the beginning and the end of Jim Crow. He is. <laughs> now there is something there. Yep. Because there you're dealing with people, you know, and the hearts of men, and <laughs> that that had to be something there. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I talked to when I talked to my dad. You know, I I still pick up his caution from the era that he, you know, was raised in. You're talking about Jim Crow and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I just take note of it. And I, rec I recognize, you know, he lived through a time when, uh, you know, different than the time I live in. So I, I have to, re I respect that. <laughs> well, you know, there there's a name for this time that we're living through. I'm trying to, I'm thinking. I'm trying to think what it what it is. <laughs> it it'd be a good one for Solomon to tell us about. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing new. Nothing new under the sun. Just coming in a different form. Hey there, my sister Kathy Shannon. Good evening, good evening sir. How's everybody? I'm hey, blessed. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Good evening, everybody. Hey, big Good evening. Uh, maybe the brother McCleskey, you you he didn't see the beginning and the end. You saw the end of Jim Crow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in the middle of Jim Crow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was in the middle of Jim Crow for for 20 something years. How do you think that that has shaped your view of mankind, particularly our lighter skinned brethren? Uh, obviously it has had an impact on, on me and all of those all of us who lived in that era. Uh, uh, we 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 suffered a great deal as a result of that. Um uh, particularly uh, uh, Jim Crow brought on uh, s some things that you know that wouldn't have happened otherwise without Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Even our self-esteem was uh, impacted by it, and uh, and some of the things that I think that uh, that we assumed and some of the things that we considered to to be right, you know, right, were just not uh, just were not. It just it wasn't to our advantage at all, and but you know uh, what what I've learned, you know, in in just studying God's word is that, uh, as children of God, you know, we're going to be in in environments that are, are very negative, right. in, in many many ways. However, God is is going to take care of us. We, you know, we always cite Romans eight twenty eight. You know. Uh, but but Satan uses a lot of things like this to to cause men to fail. Uh, it's it's a, a tactic of Satan to to deceive mankind, and that's what he's doing right now. Yeah, <laughs> he, he he's been quite successful at it, and he uses a whole lot of things. He uses uh, intimidation. Uh, uh, threats he uses um, persecution and you know that, uh, that that would include intimidation and threats he uses uh, uh, our own lust and enticement you know we, we get carried away with that kind of stuff that that leads us away he he uses all kinds of philosophies false philosophies and religions you know this is uh this is pricking my my brain for our review class, because I would love to hear 
be sleepy. Walk on this from you and uh, Sister Parham and and others, and I think Ecclesiastes might speak to some of this. So, uh, okay. I think I think we can have some of this in our review. This would be really good, I think. Uh, let me ask, who should we pray for? I, I have a number of people on the list here. I have Carol Thompson, who's in the hospital. Uh, I have Tyrone Thompson. You know, he lost his father-in-law uh, just recently. And we were just out playing <laughs> golf with him yesterday. Um, hey, I'm, I'm going to you know, have a, a prayer for our police chief. You know, that was a tragic situation that yes. occurred yesterday. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And um, he appears to be a good man. You know, he's doing a hard oh, job. Oh, I think he needs our prayers right now. Yeah. I have him on the list. John Drake. Yeah. John Drake, yeah. His, his family. Uh, but we have some other people here. Uh, Hubie Harris is, is, has lost a brother-in-law. We need to keep him in prayer. Yeah. Judy Hubbard, who usually attends our class, uh, uh, she's having some health issues, and we need to pray for her. Uh, we need to pray for a couple of people that you probably don't know. Agnes Hampton, uh, she she's the sister of uh, Curleen Jordan. Some of you remember Sister Curleen Jordan. She passed away a few years ago. Uh, she was a dear lady to me. She and Brother Jordan living? let me live in that home for almost a year uh, before I got married. You know. uh, we need to pray for the Booker family. They had a loss in their family. And another member of the church, Barbara Graves, we need to pray for her as well. Others? Yeah. Um, this is Beverly. Uh, I'm driving. I don't know if you can hear me, but did you say any? Chiquita Martin lost her brother. Yeah. Y'all gotten that word yet? And I've get, I've gotten the words. Uh, okay. And I know that uh, Robert is going to be doing his funeral Sunday, I believe. Okay, I hadn't heard the arrangements, but um, okay, thanks. Okay, she keeps for Ed Hall and Robert Waller. Ed Hall, yes, and Robert Waller both are having some physical issues. Brother Hall is going to have uh, a uh, hip replacement in uh, January, I believe. What was the first name of Brother Waller? Robert. Robert. Okay, our, our Robert Waller. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Ed Hall, I Ed Hall. Okay. When you said Ed Hall, I was thinking about the preacher with Buena Vista, but this is a different Ed Hall. Yeah, he's ours. Okay. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Okay. This is Faith. And I'd like to pray for my my son, Bobby's son. Uh, their mother, they're, they will be taking her off the uh, life support disease. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah, I know. Three months ago. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an important decision that uh, critical decision people have to make. So we will keep yeah. him in prayer. Are there others? Brother McCleskey, Annie Bass is not feeling well today. Did you get her name on there already? No, I do not. Yeah, she's not feeling well. My daughter okay. told me today. Yeah. Yeah, he okay. Uh, let, let me ask you to, to uh, all to to pray for uh, Robert and uh, and myself. We're going to be going down to the, the lectureship in Chattanooga this weekend. For, I'm for one night, Robert for a couple of nights. So uh, keep us in prayer as we travel. Uh, has there been any, any uh, update on Carolyn Rootley's son in law? No, I haven't heard anything, uh, any update on that. We can include her son. Uh, it's a grandson. In it. It's a grandson. I don't think it was her son in law. I think yeah. she was, uh, she came down in response to the message last Sunday. August afternoon. Uh, it's Marcus. Okay. 
Okay. No, not at all. I told you, I was sitting at the table. Let, let, let us go and have prayer then. All right. And Alex was sitting there. Anybody else? Is there anybody else we should include? All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Our God and our Father, thank you so much for this privilege you give us to come before you in prayer on this uh, evening as we begin our Bible study. Thank you for this privilege of studying, and we ask you to be with us and guide us, as always, is our request. And be with our teacher, Brother Johnson, as he leads us in the study, and open up our minds to your word that we might receive it well, and that it will inspire us and guide us in our journey of life. Uh, we thank you so much for the blessing of, of life that we have in Christ Jesus and the blessings we've enjoyed throughout this day. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace and your mercy and your patience and your long suffering, your kindness with us uh, throughout this journey of life. There are a number of people we want to ask your blessings upon uh, before we engage in this Bible study. And we know that you know them and others that, that need uh, our prayers, and we ask your blessings upon them, although we do not call their names. Uh, we ask your blessings upon uh, those who are ailing from from uh, sickness and disease, and we pray that you would be with them in the special ways that they need at this time. Uh, we are mindful of Carol Thompson uh, and all of those who are suffering from uh, cancer, uh, the horrible disease that has taken the lives of so many people. Uh, we ask your blessings upon Agnes Hampton, uh, the sister of our dearly beloved Caroline Jordan, who passed away a few years ago. We ask your blessings upon Barbara Graves and her illnesses, uh, and we pray that you would be with <laughs> her, as well as Ed Hall and Robert Waller, our brothers in Christ. We also ask your blessings upon Annie Bass, one of the senior members of our congregation, and we pray that you would be with her. We also pray for the grandson of Sister Carolyn Ridley, and we pray that you would be with him and bring him through a time of difficulty as far as his health is concerned. We pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, those who uh, uh, who uh, we have not mentioned, and we want to include in this uh, the family of uh, Bobby Pryor, as uh, and particularly his son, whose mother, uh, is very, very ill and uh, will be taken off of life support equipment. And we pray that you would would be with him and, and comfort him at this time. As we also pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, Brother Tyrone Thompson, particularly okay. his wife and, and his family uh, in the loss of, of his father-in-law. We likewise pray for Shakita Martin, in the loss of her brother, and we ask you to be with them in the special ways that they need. We are mindful of Sister Judy Hubbard, who always attends our class and has some very, very good comments. We pray that you would be with her as she deals with, with health issues. We pray for the Booker family and their loss. We pray that you would be with them also to comfort and strengthen them. And likewise, Heavenly Father, we pray uh, for the, the uh, police chief, and of this city and his family in the loss of, of his son. And we pray that you would just be with him. Uh, we believe that he is a, a good person. And we pray, Father, that you would comfort and strengthen that family at this time. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, for those who will be traveling. And we ask you to be with us and give us safe passage as we go forth uh, and help us to reach our destination and return to our homes. Thank you for Jesus, whom you gave to die for our sins. Be with us now as we engage in this study. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother McCluskey. Let me get right to it and share my screen here. Let me tell about Marcus. All right. Daddy's. As well. All right, we're going to be in our 11th lesson. We have 13 all together, so we're almost done. The class is going to be a review, and uh, so with that being said, in that review, uh, we'll look back at Ecclesiastes and talk about where we're going after this class as well. After talking with Brother McCleskey, we, uh, what I understand, uh, we're going to be studying the book of James next. That was what a lot of you suggested, 
And then we're going to have a brief timeline Bible study after that. And then we're going to be pursuing some of the topics that you all uh, listed. And uh, I want you to look forward to a, a little survey in the next couple classes to help us narrow down those topics that we're going to take a look at. Okay. So this study is going to be about Solomon's comment on the rat race, which is some, you know, it's not something that we invented, but it was going on back in Solomon's time as well. But just before we get to that, I want you guys to remember the website. Many of you are doing that. I'm, I'm grateful. I think it's a, a way to add to the class as well. And so go to Barry's Bureau and go to Bible study, then go to Ecclesiastes and then just scroll down to get to the um, class that you want to get to. We did record a lot of the Zoom classes. I didn't get them all as I was getting myself together. So you can look at some of the Zoom classes, uh, previous classes on the website. And there's different forms on there to fill out to help you in your thinking with Ecclesiastes. And um, there is a survey that you could take as well that I'd like to show. Sister Parham entered hers today on what she would like to see us study next. She'd like to see a topical study. Uh, the book of Jeremiah is something she would like to see us study. That, that would be a great book to study. And then um, uh, if we were to do a topic study, she's uh, mentioning the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. A, a Bible study on Satan. I got an interesting story about that, but uh, that'll be later. <laughs> and then the, the biblical timeline, I think this is a great period to look at as well, the Babylonian uh, captivity would, would be very beneficial in our understanding of God and his kingdom, okay? Now, just a quick review from our last study. There were three main areas that we looked at uh, in lesson number 10, where Solomon talked about the qualities of a wise leader. And he mentioned to us that where leaders are concerned, some are promoted beyond their capabilities, that Peter principle we talked about last week. And some people that are leaders are egotistical and intolerant of people that they see as lesser than themselves. And then he went on to list five different characteristics of a good leader. And we see those in verses one through nine. And those five characteristics were a leader has a clear mind, a cheerful disposition, a discreet mouth, a keen judgment, and a humble spirit, okay? And so that's, he moved from talking about the qualities of a wise leader and through verses 17 of chapter eight, he talked about some of the mysteries of life, not all of them, just a couple that he thought were important to bring up at this time. And these are mysteries that were beyond Solomon. These are things that Solomon says, I haven't, haven't figured this out. They're, they're mysteries to him and mysteries to us. And one of those is that the triumph of the just, that whole question about why does bad things happen to good people and why does good things happen to good people. So he talked a little bit about the triumph of the unjust. He talked about the existence of unfair consequences in verse number 14. And then he talked about the delight of untimely pleasure. And those two things are sort of different sides of, of the same coin, you know, unfair consequences on one side, untimely pleasures on the other. And we know that uh, from the Bible that it rains on the just and that's the unjust. And so that's sort of what Solomon was dealing with there. And then he talk, started talking about a philosophy of life. Now, remember, he has shifted from talking about life under the sun in a horizontal view, a horizontal perspective, just living in the world and not considering God and trying to gain satisfaction and happiness in life, he is now considering including God in that, taking a vertical, vertical perspective of life. And so when he's developing this life philosophy, starting in chapter nine, we see Solomon's new life, new life philosophy had four key truths, all right, and applications. Now the four truths were these, that God is sovereign, and that we need to recognize that, and recognizing that should cause us to act and behave in a certain way. Death is certain. It should also help out the, the human being to consider uh, spiritual things more importantly. 
the heart is evil. And Jeremiah, one of the books that Sister Parham wants to study, said that the heart was <laughs> was uh, evil uh, above all things, right? Yeah. And the fourth truth was where there is life, there is hope. He talked about that in verse number four. And then the last part of, of our review and the last part of uh, chapter nine that Solomon looked at was the application to the wisdom that, that he's giving us. And application number one that we get from verse seven was contentment. Brother Barry, I'm yes. sorry. To, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just received a, um, this is Janet. I, I received a thing from uh, Faith Pryor. She said she's trying to get into your into the Bible class. Mm -hmm. Could you let her in? All right, I need you let me in now. I didn't for some reason when I share my screen, I don't see who needs to get in. I'm putting letting them in now. Thank you for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had six of them waiting there. Gee whiz. <laughs> All right, let's get back to uh my lesson. Uh oh, they're gonna do that. Give me a second here. There we go. Okay. Message is received from you, right? All right. You guys see the screen again? We back on? Uh, not yet. <laughs> uh, I see a landscape or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, I put the wrong one on there. Okay. All right. Now let's try it again. This top number two. How about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. How about that? Uh huh. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right, so four applications that we're talking about are contentment, uh, spirituality, the whole idea of being pure, uh, faithfulness, and then zeal he ended with in chapter uh, nine, verse number 10. All right, so that's a quick review of what we studied uh, last week. So we're gonna move right into uh, chapter 11 and Solomon is gonna start commenting mm -hmm. on the rat race that we're all involved in, okay? Now, our question to get us off at this on the website and to get us off thinking about the lesson was, how is the rat race det detrimental to spiritual understanding? How is the rat race detrimental to spiritual understanding? And I had one, two, three, four. I had five responses this week. Thank you all so much. I so appreciate it when I plant, when I do these things and you guys participate in them. It's very rewarding. And so thank you, Sister uh, Effie. Effie Booth says, Christians uh, believe we are made in the image of Jehovah God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, and sanctified for a higher calling to make our lives a living sacrifice. We are not rats in a race. We are images of God on missions to replicate his love. Dr. Jones used to tell us, to do all we can, as best we can, as long as we can. And so that would certainly be a good uh, admonition uh, and not get involved in this uh, rat race that we sometimes can draw us away from spiritual things. Mm -hmm. Sister Parham says the rat race is one in which we often willingly participate. If I understand the question correctly, the race we run is often detrimental to spiritual understanding because it often requires our time and attention to matters of inconsequential things and takes away time and attention. Another person coming in there. Time and attention from those things that are spiritually important and beneficial to others. For example, studying the word, teaching others about Christ, helping others, etc. Our rat race usually involves career advancement, sports, and making more money to buy things. And none of those things promote us spiritually. Amen. So well said, Sister Parham. Thank you for that. Brother Moore, more people coming in. Click, click. Okay. Brother Moore had this to add. Too much, too soon, all the time. Following this pattern puts the belief that you can't serve two matters squarely and unequivocally in play. In other words, two masters, two masters, two masters. It puts it squarely in play. All right. In other words, it just can't be done. Either you hate one and love the other. Or, or when you find yourself caught up in wanting all the money, status and prestige a worldly life provides. It won't be hard to lose sight of your first love. Well said, furthermore, 
Did mm -hmm. I get the, the gist of how you were putting that down? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sister, Sister uh -huh. Valerie McLean, she, he, she has this to add to the class. This is a difficult question. No man is an island. Our life today is calculated to keep man from thinking about spiritual things. Hey, yes, it is. The prince of the air does not want us to consider anything where God is concerned as a priority. So I'm, I'm echoing that, Sister McLean. Sometimes we have to be still like the children of Israel in Exodus 14 and let God lead us. I like that. You're certainly not going to be still in the rat race. That's for sure. And then Sister Paulette Thompson says, if one is genuinely focused on the things under the sun, the rat race causes the focus to shift away from God. When you focus on the things of the world, acquiring, grasping to gain materially, more power, prestige, and all that these things entail, your mind can't be properly aligned with God's will and way for our lives. If we continue to follow these things, we will be closer aligned to the, quali uh, to the qualities and characteristics of the fool than the wise person, and that will cause a definite shift away from God. Well, I don't even think I need to teach because y'all y'all nailed it on those right there. That was that was good. I like that. Um, very very good comments there, and we're certainly going to see that in uh, Solomon's uh, journal of Ecclesiastes uh, to the assembly uh, about the vanity and a chasing after the wind uh, that the rat race certainly has become. So let's let's get right into it. So in the workbook, uh, these are my responses. Uh, in the introduction, because as he comments on the rat race, Solomon has been sharing the fruit of his hard-won wisdom. After living apart from God, he returns and notes some of the things he has learned concerning wisdom itself. So in these, ver in these verses, godly wisdom beats the rat race. That's, that's my summary that, that Solomon is going to be dealing with. And as an introduction, Solomon provides more insights about wisdom and its use in life. So we'll, we'll learn how to deal with certain kind of people in our lives because uh, we're all tempted with, we're all challenged with trying to stay out of this rat race. And as Sister Thompson put it, try to live wisely and not like the fool. So our culture did not invent the rat race mentally. The idea of working harder and harder, longer and longer, and gaining less and less satisfaction is not new. And so Solomon with his great wisdom uh, teaches us about this with the Holy Spirit moving him along. First of all, in verse 11, we see that the race is foolish. Solomon said, and again, I saw under the sun. So once again, this is the horizontal view. This is men trying to live without God, okay? I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability for time and chance overtake them all, all right? So Solomon's comments on the rat race of his day in verse 11 is that waking up early, running faster, being the strongest and all of those earthly advantages that we think we have do not guarantee success, all right? And so he's he says that under the sun, this, this is vanity. This is a chasing after, after the wind, all right? He goes on to comment about the rat race, uh, saying trusting in your ability is foolish, okay? In verses 12 and 13, he writes, moreover, man does not know his time, like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare. So the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Also, this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. So it, it is, it's a false notion that only the strong survive. You know, that's how Satan has sort of set this world up as, you know, we try to live according to the code of the jungle. Only the strongest survive kind of thing. Well, that's a false notion, all right? Trouble and death ensnare all. Whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, you're going to run into trouble. Whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, 
you're going to die. Whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, life has its ups and it has its downs. That's what Solomon is referring to. So rushing to be first causes its own kinds of problems and trying to endeavor in the world from only the strong survive is going to uh, present for us or keep us away from the spiritual understandings that we need in order to have the type of peace and the type of joy that will ultimately allow us to enjoy the lives that God himself has blessed us with. So trusting in your own ability is foolish from Solomon's perspective, okay? He also says those who remain in the rat race are fools. This kind of goes to Sister Thompson's point, all right? You need to learn how to come out of that rat race. <laughs> there was a small city, this is Solomon talking here, verse 14 and 15, with a few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and uh, constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. So that, that's that idea of, you know, time goes on and we forget about uh, people and events uh, with, with time. You know, it's, 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 we're entering in a period of day where uh, the, our youth uh, will have to ask the question, who, who was, you know, Martin Luther King? You know, we know who he was, but, but time has its way of putting things towards the back of our minds. So that the rat race forgets the acts of wisdom is a sure thing. The rat race produces self-centered people, insensitive people, and uh, insensitive to spiritual things as well. And so those who remain in the rat race um, from an under the sun perspective are what the Bible would call and what Solomon would call fools, all right? So he starts talking about life in the fast lane, going back up to verse 11 again. And he tells us, teaches us that human activity cannot guarantee genuine success. Verse 11, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to warriors and neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability for time and chance overtake them all. Human activity does not guarantee success. So true success in life is measured by peace and joy and love that we all, that we want to experience and that we want to share. And these are gifts that come from God. All right. So true success is measured by peace, joy, and love. And those are gifts that come from God. So human activity does not guarantee genuine success. Notice none of those things dealt with financial uh, success, all right? Because whether one is rich uh, by worldly standards or poor by worldly standards, he can still have peace, he can still have joy, and he can still have love, all right? In the fast lane, Solomon teaches us in verses 15 and 16 that strength is more impressive uh, yet less effective than wisdom. This is what he says. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Okay. Yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. So the king that came against the city was strong, strong enough to have an army, strong enough to have army equipment. That's the siege works that he put on the city. Uh, but he wasn't able to overtake the city. The city was delivered by a poor man. What did the poor man have? He had wisdom, okay? And he had the wisdom that is a vertical perspective, all right? So it, strength is impressive, but it's, not, it's, but it's less effective than wisdom. So wisdom is not cultivated by doing that could be a whole lesson right there, but let me let me keep moving. Wisdom is not cultivated by doing. It's more cultivated by listening. When we shift gears from strength to wisdom, we take our first steps out of the rat race. So when we learn to listen instead of just, oh, I got this, I'm strong enough, I've done this before, you know, that kind of thing. When we listen and we slow down, we shift gears from the human strength that we have and start 
uh, yielding to the godly wisdom that's available to us, then we've taken our first steps out of the rat race, okay? Solomon also talks about life in the fast lane, that wise counsel is not usually popular. It's rarely obeyed and it is seldom remembered. We just saw that as well, right? Because it says that, but the wisdom of the poor man is despised and his words are not heeded, okay? Re um, so not they're not usually popular, rarely obeyed and <laughs> seldom remembered. We're talking about wisdom there. It is human nature that we forget the lessons that we should remember, especially from a spiritual standpoint, right? I believe that's why the Lord set up memorials for us. I believe that's why we assemble on the first day of the week. I believe that's why it's important to come to the midweek Bible study, because as our human nature um, doesn't carry with it the capacity uh, to keep in reserve the spiritual wisdom that comes from God. That's if we only operate under the sun from a horizontal view. And so that uh, yielding to that spiritual wisdom, that gets us out of the rat, way, rat, the rat race and allows us to walk in the wisdom that's more effective than human strength. Okay. Sister Thompson, you got your hand up? Yes. I, I think one of the things that this, this struck in my mind later on, he talks about uh, the leaders and why a fool is not a person you follow. And by contrast, when you think about a leader who is very sensitive and who's willing to listen to you and to hear what your concerns, not necessarily complaints, but your concerns are that are troubling you, or right. even to ask you what what's going on. What's bothering you? Those are the leaders that you kind of gravitate toward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think Solomon spoke to that too. That was that uh, that ability to empathize that yeah. leaders have. Yeah. That, but you have to be able to listen in order to know to do that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, right, so in the fast lane, thank you for that. Uh, human rulers will always shout down wise counselors and fools like it that way. Solomon writes, the words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. So the rat race is noisy, okay? And that's on purpose, all right? Uh, the rat race is noisy and most like it this way. This type of noise drowns out the quiet voice of God, the quiet voice of the spirit. And we had in our comments earlier, before we got into the lesson, uh, the idea of being still, all right? I thought that was a wonderful thing when the children of Israel uh, got delivered from Egypt and as God was about to work one of, one of his final miracles over the land of Egypt and Pharaoh and its army, and they were about to come down on the children of Israel and, and the Red Sea was right before them and they seemed to be trapped. Um, it, human instinct, is to yell and to shout and to cry for help. And but Moses was told to tell them to be still and see the deliverance of the Lord. And and that allowed them to to take in in a greater way uh, their deliverance, I believe. And and we know know from that that they crossed over on dry ground and then the children of Israel are the Pharaoh's army wanted to drown him in that red sea. Just a glad ease. You got yes. your hand. Yes, thank you. This chapter nine, where the focus is, is on enjoying life while you have it. And also um, this thing about people who are poor and have wisdom are not remembered. Um, that's not my experience. And this, horizontal thinking. Pardon me. Yeah, you you have a vertical perspective, so I understand why it's not your experience. <laughs> well, and even, I mean, this thing about living, 
I'm I, I just was I read over this today and I was thinking about how this passage was good for that time because they didn't have what we have. They didn't have we don't they don't have, he didn't have the New Testament. He doesn't have what Jesus said. He doesn't even have what Jesus said about Solomon. You know, he is Solomon had wisdom, but Jesus said he told those Pharisees, here's one greater than you. Yeah. But you know, they didn't they didn't acknowledge Jesus because he was poor, because he wasn't born as a king, because how he lived. This whole thing to me, yes, this was good for his time, for Solomon time. But for me, um, it doesn't speak to a life of what Christians would be living now today. We don't even think about, I mean, I, I'm just speak for myself, trying to enjoy life to the fullest as if there is nothing after life. Uh, I know Brother McCluskey not long ago, I don't know, maybe in a couple of two or three months ago, he did that message about the crossover. Yeah. Crossing over from, you know, different um different version in our growth as is is from here to glory, our growth. We're not worried about these things. I'm saying this focus about trying to enjoy all I can because there's nothing left. There's nothing left after I'm after this life is over. This is for that time period because they didn't have what we have. It's the only thing I'm saying. So trying to make this seem such a part, so relevant for me today, um, it's, I'm just in a different, my thought process is just different from what this is. That's all I'm saying. Okay, I can I can buy that, but I think that uh, I'm, I'm my mindset is all 66 books of the Bible are profitable to me. And they, they are, but I do know Jesus said, I think it was, I read it today, Matthew 14, he was trying to tell them, yeah, Solomon, he was telling those Pharisees, yes, Solomon has wisdom, wisdom, but he, you won't even hear what I'm saying, and here I am, I'm one with more than what Solomon had, but yet you won't listen to me. So I'm thinking even today where some people you know, you gotta you gotta have a certain uh, image or whatever before people will even listen to you. Right. You gotta be. We have that going on even today. The same thing it was when Jesus' time. You know, during his time. So um, we're not looking for being here on earth forever. We don't we don't look for that. We're looking for Jesus. It's just a different mindset. Is what I'm saying. So what's going on now? We know this is temporary because we're looking to eternity. That's right. So I don't try to enjoy. I mean, you want to enjoy life, but if it doesn't happen, you you're not trying to worry about. Well, I'm dead. I'm ne nothing else is going to happen after that. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm saying. Yep, absolutely. We we have a little more wisdom on our side because we have the New Testament. You you are absolutely correct. But I think even I think it's in Romans where Paul talks about the things that were written aforetime were written for our knowledge. Mm -hmm and for our encouragement. And All so right. I, I think that um, there's mm -hmm. a way to look at books like Ecclesiastes so they could be beneficial. Oh, yes. I think it's, it's very, it's, yes, it's very beneficial, especially for those who do not, have not accepted, um, you know, have mm -hmm. not been accepted Christ. This is very relevant, very yeah. relevant because that's what people do. It is a rat race. And that's all you do. It's very relevant. I agree. But I'm just saying to us who are who are looking forward, who who believe what Christ has said, that he's coming back, who believe what Jesus had taught, that we have a we're not stressed out about this, at least not stressed out about it. But people who don't believe in Christ, yes, it is a rat race. And I think this was very relevant. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, I'll keep going there. Thank, thanks yeah. for that. So life in the fast lane here now in this fifth item is he says wisdom is better than war. I think we would all agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. He said that specifically. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. All right. And so my comments to that was, and, and it was also from the author of this study as well. One foolish act can destroy much good that wisdom builds. And so it just takes one person 
you know, doing something wrong to mess everything up. Sister Barbara Brown, you got your hand up. Can you hear me? Yeah, last week we couldn't hear you. I don't know what happened. But you, My you laptop it. was messed up. Oh, you got it figured out now. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, but what I was getting ready to say was that I think I, who was that just talking? That was Gladys. Gladys. Yeah. Who was that? Sister Gladys. Gladys. Yeah, I can understand where she's coming from, but I'll, like she said, what I'm talking about, but really, that was during the time of Solomon when Solomon was alive and things were, were the same but not different. But anything under the sun has happened before. But the thing about it is when we talk about Solomon, Solomon was 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 true enough, he had wisdom. But there's also wisdom now in this world. Also people have wisdom and they know how to live and not live. It doesn't matter about the red race. Every day you should be trying to live your life anyway. Man. About everything and anything that's going on in this world. Because people are still doing the same things they did before. Because it was during that time. Because that's why God destroyed the world the last time. Secondly, it's going to happen again. Because things are even getting worse from now. I mean, in Israel, it's war. And then the third thing, which is the first thing, if you study it and you read it, you also know that this world wasn't promised to us. It yeah. was heaven that was promised to us. Right. So it doesn't make a difference what's going on in a rat race or anything else that's happening. Our goal is supposed to be really actually living our lives to God, to whatever he has put in the Bible and his instructions so that we will go to heaven. Because I so I work in medicine, I work with people, and they always say, I'm ready to go. Even if they're not Christians, I'm ready to go. In other words, what they say is they satisfied with whatever done happened, whatever done went on here. And a lot of them think they're going to heaven. I can't say they are, and I can't say they are, are not going. But the whole point of it is, is that our goal that has been given to us is to give the word to people and to let them know what's going on so that each soul but actually know they're given right that's given not by man and nobody else, but only by God to have the opportunity to go to heaven. So it really, that's the whole thing of it is. It's not searching down here for the true wisdom of what makes this world run or not run, because we do know it's going away. It's making sure that our wisdom is being studied through the Bible and teaching and learning and training in that aspect. So whatever we find and whatever we get and whatever that is and teaches us to the understanding that surpasses where God see in that verse and I can't remember all of it. It mm. takes us toward the goal of going to heaven. Yes. Because even when we're here, I mean, you know, like I said, this world is not promised to us. It was heaven that was promised to us. So we know we ain't gonna be no better than Jesus Christ because he got done in. He Things happened to him. He was mistreated. It didn't stop anything because God already had planned anyway from the beginning to send him here for this very purpose yeah. so that we could go. You guys are nailing it and you are demonstrating very good vertical perspective. <laughs> vertical perspective. And Solomon's book is split in half and uh, we're, we're gleaning. We're gleaning from the knowledge that he puts down on us. I find it interesting that the empire of of Israel at its greatest height, the, its, its most prosperous was during the time of Solomon. And in that time, we get a book like this, Ecclesiastes. So that, that, should, that should give us pause, pause to think there. And becoming a child of God, becoming a Christian, uh, and reflecting just on my own life, there was a time when I thought it would be proper to say, I can, you know, I'm going to live forever. I, I want to live forever. I don't think that way no more. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not looking to live forever anymore. I'm looking to live forever in heaven. Right. Like you said, Sister Brown and Gladys, our, our reward and our goal is not found in this land. It's found in the land to come. So that those are very, very good points. Very good. All right. So 
wisdom, perhaps to where Sister Brown and Gladys were pulling us, he starts comparing this wisdom and this folly, all right? And uh, and we'll learn from these contrasts ways to deal with those in our lives who have only uh, horizontal view perspectives, who are only considering life from a worldly and a fleshly perspective. That's the kind of wisdom we're going to gain from Solomon to use uh, with people like that. You know, there is a spiritual component to our existence that most of the world ignores, all right? So, and he is going to nail these down by talking about wisdom and folly, the wise and the foolish. And so he talks about advantages and disadvantages of wisdom. A dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart directs him, directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Mm -hmm. When the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool, all right? So Solomon gets into contrasting these things as, as you all have been saying. He builds a case, um, for why, why, lively or living wisely. And he contrasts wisdom versus folly. And those advantages of uh, disadvantages of wisdom, he talks about honor and strength versus foolishness and ruin. And fools eventually earn their reputation as fools. We see that in our world. Sister Brown, is that your hand up again? Yeah, can I say one more thing? I don't want to be yeah, talking yeah. too much. You get, you get two I... seconds, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was getting ready to say that. Uh, you know, I love the Old Testament because it leads up to the New Testament. It is history. It tells you and shows you everything what's in the New Testament. But I was getting ready to say, you know, during the time of Moses, Abraham, and Solomon, so all of those men that God had that did things for him, they also perceived the same thing. One small thing, like when uh, Moses was trying to do all this stuff, I said, if it was Moses or somebody, and uh, the the one of his wives' father told him, "You need help. Yeah. You need help to do this stuff, and you know, pick and choose people." But what I was really was, going to uh, say Jeff is this: his father-in-law, mm -hmm. right? What I was really going to say is this: it's God is also showing us also all these people. A lot of them, they had money, they had stuff, mm -hmm. they were in good health. It's okay for a Christian to be rich. It's okay for a Christian to have this or that. God is saying it's nothing wrong. We can have all those things. Enjoy them to the fullest. Be, be whatever you want to be, but you still have to be on him yes. and you have to be doing what he say. He's letting us know that he loves us enough that he would do the same thing to us. If things haven't changed, just because Solomon and Moses and all the rest of them gone, he'll do it for everybody else. Right. You just got to be on the right. Clear. It's okay to be rich and to have stuff. A lot of times people say, oh, you have that, you have that. So what? If you work for it, you got good credit, or you got it right or stuff like that, and God allowed it, it ain't nobody's business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You know, ride with it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. God allows us to prosper and yes. to have things and be productive and be at our greatest when we follow Him. Yes. All right. So let me uh, let me let me go on a little speed slide here with our, our remaining time. And once again, on the website, all of these slides are on the website if you'd like like to review them. But as Solomon goes on and contrasts wisdom and folly. We see humility and patience. He contrasts against popularity and partiality. He talks about the inevitable risk versus inexcusable stupidity. This, this would answer, I was hoping to have a little time to talk about the difference between investment and gambling. This falls in that teaching. And some people want to say, you know, the stock market, that's just gambling. It's like, no, it's that's different than gambling. All right. And that, that would fall in this category here, all right? Um, then when he talks about the character of a fool, he talks about his language is one of disbelief, uh, that he talk, when he talks, he talks foolishly, and he has scripture that goes along with that. Uh, fools have uncertain futures. He, he deals with that. Uh, they are their own worst enemy, fools are, right? 
Uh, they make poor leaders. He talked about wise leaders in the previous lesson there. And then he starts uh, talking about the idea that they, they waste time and money. All right. And then the, he ends with how do you deal with a fool? All right. So this is part of us being able to deal with people in our own uh, world today with the horizontal view. Uh, he talks about isolating them, which mm -hmm. we have to, to build oh, that. That's not being mean by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, restore them only if there's evidence of repentance and brokenness. I would have loved to have more time to deal with this, you guys, because as Christians, we are called to forgive. But uh, biblically, we need to understand the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. All right. There's a difference there. And, uh, and it allows us to be uh, forgiving people, I believe. And then he talks about, thirdly, uh, when to restore. We came back pretty quick. And when a person is restored, it's a very good idea to proclaim the change, to advertise that change. When one has been restored. So those are the items that uh, come from the rat race. Um, you can see my notes on the website and you can see the rest of the slides there as well. And I do have like one little announcement in the form of a video, little one 90 second video. Y'all got time for a 90 second video? Yes. It, it's of me. So this is not me being vain. It's just me kind of trying to advocate, okay? <laughs> Let me share this with you all. Hey, family and friends. You know, I'm in my gazebo right now. And it's a beautiful day outside. I got my laptop and my mini screens out here uh, preparing for a lesson to deliver this coming Sunday. And I wrote down some copy uh, as a little introduction for, for that sermon that I'd like to share with you all. Here, here, here it goes. Tell me if you like this. Does it feel like we are living in a bitter world? Are you feeling hopeless, unable to escape from the virus that has infected our land? Are you at a loss for a remedy, a cure to what ails our fellow human beings? Then join us this Sunday at 915 at the Schrader Lane Church of Christ in Nashville, Tennessee for a powerful sermon on Exodus 15 verses 22 through 27. There we'll discover how ancient Israel overcame their heartbreaking situation and experience God's deliverance from a bitter water source will gain the encouragement and direction of this Old Testament witness. It's provided for us a way where we can see through stewardship, strategy, and execution will make our bitter water sweet and heal the virus in our land. So join me and others in preparation and prayer that we might experience the salvation of the Lord as we bring the good news to an infected land. Lord willing, we'll see you this Sunday. May God bless you. <laughs> All right, I hope to see y'all Sunday. <laughs> Very good. Amen. Thank you. Looks looking good. forward, looking forward to it. Very good. <laughs> Any comments or questions before we dismiss? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating in the surveys and the quizzes and the questions and the comments. Good uh, class. Thank you. All those for a very good class. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. There. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Everybody. Great good class. Thank you, brother. Well, Jasmine. All right. Have a good one. Same. Good, good, good night. Good job, brother. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Oh, we got some great comments in the chat too. I'm gonna have to learn how to add those too, some kind of way. Very good. <laughs> wow. Got a book, pretty big class now, don't you? Yeah. Well, the Mary class is um, I guess they're done for right now. So we picked up uh a few of them as well. So. Very good. You usually have 40 participants. I, I noticed it said 50 today. So yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that's up nice. the good work and see you in church on Sunday, you all. Thank you, sister. All right, Wanda. <laughs> good night. Good night, all. All right. We'll see you, brother McCleskey. <laughs> yes.